Good afternoon and welcome to the Walters Art Museum. And I'm assuming I'm talking loud enough, but if you ever can't hear one of us speaking since we don't have a mic, just wave your hand in the back and we'll try to be louder. Uh, my name is Stefan Riker. I'm the editor of Smartish Pace, which is a local poetry magazine. And uh, we're partly responsible for today's reading. Um, so the, uh, the magazine, I started it 13 years ago here in Baltimore. I actually started, I realized today, um, just up the road, Kat and I were talking about where we first lived in Baltimore, and I lived in an apartment, like four or five blocks up here. We were almost neighbors, but for a six years difference. And uh, so yeah, we're from Baltimore. The magazine looks like this. We have uh, 19 issues so far, and we also do events like today here at the Walters, and um, other events throughout Baltimore. We have several things coming up this summer, which you can check out um, on our website. Other readings and, and literary parties. Um, <coughs> I should also note we have readings in other cities. Um, there's going to be like readings in six different cities this year. So if you're not from here, you happen to be on vacation, you're going back home to like Raleigh or DC or New York or Nashville or the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have readings there real soon. Um, thank you to Jacqueline Leo of the Walters in the back. Thank you very much for setting up today's reading. Jacqueline is new here at the museum. I met her about 10 minutes ago. But um, she is uh, worked very hard to coordinate today's reading. And have it looking like it does for everybody here today. So thank you for your work on this. Smartish Pace is a nonprofit organization. Everybody associated with it volunteers and actually pays um, to be part of it. So I want to thank the all the Smartish Pace volunteers. Um, the ones who are here today, Claire Banks, who's an associate editor and reads poems for the magazine, is here and she'll be introducing Cal McGrath a little later. Also, two of our interns, Tracy Nettinger, who's a brand new intern, is here. She's edited one thing for us so far, and it's awesome. And um, our other intern, Jessica Yu, who's a, a, a been an intern for a year now um, at Hopkins, is here as well. And I don't think Jared Fisher is here, but he might be any second, and he's also an assistant editor of the magazine. Uh, finally, thank you to the poets, of course, for um, generously being here and reading for everybody, and thanks for, for coming out to the reading. So I'm going to introduce the first poem reading today was Piat Viazda, and I've had the opportunity to read his work from submissions <coughs> to the magazine, as well as his two books, and um, the books look like this. And he also has books here available afterwards if you're interested in um, pursuing. Um, and especially in his recent work, that this book is really new, just a few weeks old, um, the poems illuminate a lot of sort of absurdities and inconsistencies um, in U.S. culture or cultures in general and society um, and at times within ourselves. Um, the poems seem to be persistently concerned with perceptions of the world and our ability or lack of to understand what those perceptions actually mean. Um, it makes the poems um, philosophical without sort of being over in the reference to philosophy. Although I did mention, as I was looking this over again um, this morning, that you do reference somebody. Epictetus, yes, a stoic philosopher. And I thought, well, that's, it's, well, it's kind of funny because these poems are not the banner of stoicism. But. So the one philosophical reference is it's funny. Um, so I think the poems are lively and smart and, and very surprising. And get the sense of reading them like you're a part of the poem. Um, or maybe you just lived an identical life to Piaz, which is unlikely. Um, he was born in Poland and he came to the U.S. in 1991. Um, he received a B.A. in English from Southern Connecticut State University, a Ph.D. in English from New York University. He has published also a critical volume, uh, James Merrill and W.H. Auden, Homosexuality and Poetic Influence, which appeared in 2007. And his latest of his two books is Messages, looks like this. And this just appeared. 
He has received numerous grants and fellowships for his work, and he's currently the Associate Professor of English at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he teaches modern and contemporary poetry, along with American literature and world literature. And with that, I welcome Pia. street corner in Baltimore, three men are painting over a mural when a woman in a car asks them, why are you doing this? They reply, the new owner wants it this way. Okay. Uh, and now messages, uh, as Stefan said, the book has just come out. Uh, from Pound Road Press, and the editors of the press are actually in the audience. Thank you so much for coming, Patrick and Marianne. Uh, I would like to read several poems from this collection. I will start with Ether. And when I say Ether, uh, some of you probably think about uh, the sky or air or outer space, as others are probably <coughs> reminded of T.S. Eliot's patient, he drives upon the table. But I actually mean ether also in the political sense, um, in the sense that Antonio Negri and Michael Hart, for example, mean it when in their famous, much discussed book, Empire, published 10 or so years ago, they call ether one of the most three fundamental mediums of imperial control, the other two mediums being uh, military power and uh, uh, the power of money, the power of capital. I talk about this a little bit in the interview that, that's also included in the book. Um, anyway, uh, by ether basically they mean culture and communications, something that is regulatory on the one hand, but also potentially a site of democracy. So that was my little lecture, and now the <laughs> Uh, the world is everything that is not the case. A system of remote processors and massive databases, networks of communication, cloud computing, etc. Thus, anything, anything can be put into a poem. The morning star, the morning news, the lost dog, the lost cause, your feelings, your bank account, parents, hope, especially hope. And it is up to the poet to translate, i.e. to say, you think this is a movie, but it isn't a movie. You think this is freedom, but it's a Chinese toy. The poet is a hacker, is armed information a spoiler of the tyrant's feast, a disturber of the public peace, a traveler on the red eye, an assassin in the boardroom. Poetry is a matter of perspective, perception, rather. All you need to do is pay attention to what you are looking for or looking at, as with the dark rabbit. And voila, out in the ether, some Gnostic chant, some joyous cantata begins. Nothing happens, something does. First nature, then culture. First thanks, then thanks. First handshake, then bullet. First eyesore, then gentrification. First speeches, 
then more speeches, followed by the big lie. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Never repeat yourself. And the plain truth and les mots juste and bird song and mother tongue, the reconstruction of dreams. Since we are in a museum, uh, this might be an appropriate poem to read. Uh, it's called The Golden Age. A house, a bridge, a mountain. How many features make up a landscape? How empty the canvas. Our books repeat the seven basic plots. Another adds, we are just a pack of neurons. Then we forget everything. Is this the twilight of the golden age? An hour in a museum, and I know all about art. A day in a foreign city, and I know all cities. A week with you, and I know love. Two more weeks, I know the end of love. Our lives are comfortable, long. We go to the movies, even when no movies are playing. We keep ourselves interested, games, trips, sometimes a party till we die from some accident or disease, but mostly boredom. Every morning we proclaim, the world is within my understanding. What's stopping us though? These marble hands, these limestone eyes, the boiling earth, the swollen sun. Ghost photography. A new dogma. Miracles are glorified coincidences. Clocks are pushed back and forward, but mirrors show nothing out of focus. Feelings are unintentional. There is wisdom in groupthink, we think. Some faces look happier than others but everyone's buttocks are symmetrical, and on this basis we shall establish yesterday a new ethical order, something to believe in, like ghost photography or kindness to animals. Indeed, we no longer eat them. It's harder, though, to make a connection with things. Things break too easily. They don't feel pain, and they don't react when we call them or them names. This mouse will do for a pet. This cat will do for a present. A yawn in the classroom, a disturbance at the border, nature yoga, space travel, anaplasty, or a plane crash caught on camera will do for a revolution. Clouds have parted. The boat returns to the harbor. In October, blue is the opposite of blue. A turn. The violence of the visible. Always a distraction. Always a confusion. Something gets crowded out. But what? 
a man and a woman appear, walk to the end of the wharf, sit down on a bench. He smokes a cigarette. She sends a text message. During sleep, I talk in a language no one understands. Ten minutes later, they are gone. Time is a prison, said Nabokov. He could remember shades of shadow. I remember intensities of light, the glow of the moon last evening as I walked up and down Water Street, the shine of last autumn's lamp. The color of yesterday is gray. The color of last week is green with thin streaks of yellow. Last year is of a fading color, the kind I'll never see again. The air feels like a knife blade, a perfect day, split in half. A day in the life of... In my mind I have an image of a poet who no longer exists. In my hand I hold the key to his apartment. Why do we forget so much year after year? The apartment replies with pebbles and stars. This one is called uh, Ohio and West. This is the one with a uh, reference to Epictetus. Uh, you can read Epictetus or drive your Toyota Echo into a lamppost. <laughs> you can watch a movie about angels or lose your way in the valley of sexual dependency. You can teach a person to swim or torture a person in the name of national security. You can say to your doctor, pinch me, I'm dreaming. Drink, drink a glass of water. You can take pictures of yourself or smash your camera. Or you can marry, change an opinion, move to Ohio. You can say America first or join the social movement. Or you can slowly decay, jump from a roof, write a proposal. You can test a new product or experience a vision in the grove. You can play an overlong game of risk or be abducted by aliens. You can assume a pose, defeated. You can say, I did what I could. You can focus 100% on what's immediately before you. A password, a spider web, gift wrapping, sunset. You can ask yourself three uncomfortable questions. One, would I lay down my life? Two, am I happy enough? Three, where is my wallet? And drive your Toyota Echo all the way to Ohio to watch a movie about aliens. No matter what you do, you will feel smart, renewed. You can say to America, pinch me, I'm dreaming, or defeated, read to your doctor. I did what I could. You can teach a person to slowly decay or torture a person in the name of national security or change an opinion in that valley of sexual dependency. You can focus 100% on an overlong game of risk, test a vision of the growth, experience a new product or be abducted by Epictetus. <laughs> Take pictures of a social movement, marry a proposal. You can drink on the lamppost, smash a glass of water, assume a pose, <coughs> swim on a roof, renew a spider web with your camera, ask yourself three questions, one about sacrifice, one about happiness, one about gift wrapping, then lose your smart way in a sunset. No matter what you do, first enter the password. The last poem is called Clouds Moving In, consists of two parts. One, Warsaw, the city he desperately wants to revisit. The city he has abandoned. By city, of course, we mean people. It has taken him years 
hours maybe, to know himself. What we understood all along from his medical records. Since then, there have been important changes in his life. That never changes. He's thicker, thinner. He's dressed in white. Mostly, he's absent-minded, a master of evasion. Always out on a walk, just as it starts to snow. <coughs> Dear New Yorker, please cancel my subscription. I'm having an uphill moment, a bella croix moment. <coughs> These days, I only read junk mail. Have you seen me? cries the face on the missing children leaflet. Ashley. What really concerns me, though, is the way my body reacts in front of an onrushing car, how it's wafted by the wind from late October to early April, what a fast dance, what a tendentious cloud. I've never been to Warsaw. <coughs> 